Okay, good Friday morning, everyone. A happy winter solstice. My name is Tim Vargo, and I'm and you are watching the Backyard Naturalist, brought to you by the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It is brutal outside here. My phone tells me that it's minus ten uh, temperature, minus thirty three wind chill. It's actually warmed up a little bit. So I, I hope you're watching this in in relative creature comfort. This is the penultimate backyard naturalist of 2022, another holiday version as we look at the not so common common potato. However you say it, however you spell it, the potato is enormously popular and a widespread form of sustenance celebrated year round in the form of McDonald's fries, but especially around the holidays. I think most holidays this time of year have, have some form of, of potato associated uh, with it. Uh, whether it be the, the Hanukkah latkes or the, the Swedish Hasselbach spotatis, uh, the Irio from Kenya, or the patate al forno from Italy. Potatoes are everywhere and have had major impacts across the world throughout history, as we'll see today as we look at the natural and human history of the potato in episode 17 of season four of The Backyard Naturalist. There will be spud but first, and as always, thank you so much to those of you who support the Backyard Naturalist with your subscriptions and for the joy you bring me every Friday morning at 9 a.m. Thank you for keeping me company throughout the year. And next week, we're going to continue the tradition we started last year as we ring in the new year with a special version of the Backyard Naturalist, a virtual fireside chat. There will be no featured organism. Uh, we'll all get together. Whoever shows up, that'll be the right people. Bring a short story to, to share, fiction or nonfiction, uh, off the top of your head, a, a poem that you wrote or someone else wrote that you like. Uh, bring photos or videos, your New Year's resolutions. Um, I'll be tuning in for my in-law's house in Maine with my nice Huga cup of coffee with a touch of maple syrup, and we'll just hang out and, and celebrate the coming year. I'd love for you to join. Uh, and as you all know, I love following our backyard connection to the heavens. There were some fantastic astronomical achievements uh, in this in 2022. And I'll just share a short video that Nova put together. That's a really nice look at um, at the the events of the year. And I can't get this in here, so I'm just going to have to do a quick. Um, stop and restart my sharing my screen and try this here and let's see if we can get this to work and let's see if we can watch this together from learning the physics behind how things work to getting a handle on calculus Brilliant.org helps learners of any age get hands-on with math, science, and computer science. Brilliant is a proud sponsor of NOVA. Visit Brilliant.org slash NOVA to learn more. Let's revisit three of this year's biggest space stories. The James Webb Space Telescope, the most powerful space telescope ever built, sent back stunning images of nebulas, galaxies, close-ups of Neptune and Jupiter, and even chemical signatures in the atmosphere of an exoplanet. As the first images came in, scientists were blown away. This is an engineering image that was really there just to say we focused it right. And there's a lot of galaxies, <laughs> you know. You know, the, the engineers were like, what are all those galaxies yeah. doing there? We're realizing we're the first people that have ever seen these galaxies. Everything about these images that I've seen so far tells us absolutely this thing is going to be fantastic. We don't know what we're going to see, but we know we haven't seen anything like this before. This is going to be transformative. This is looking amazing. I almost have no words, you know, <laughs> in that sense, because it's it's the feat of engineering, right? But it's also, wow, our universe is beautiful. The great thing is that really, this is just the beginning. Today is just the beginning. We'll be able to go much, much deeper. And this telescope is going to do what we designed it to do. JWST's infrared technology can peer through dense clouds of space dust that block visible light, revealing secrets of the universe. This is the biggest telescope that has been built in space. 
and uh, because of the complexity of the design. This is no doubt the most complex machine, and it is magnificent. Scientists expect JWST to deliver years of discoveries about the early universe in the first galaxies, how stars and planets evolved, and the atmospheres of exoplanets. It's taken us a long time to get here, but man, we're so excited. This year, NASA put Earth's defense strategy against dangerous asteroids to the test. We want to know whether or not we will be able to redirect an asteroid. We have a fantastic team of planetary defenders trying to find the near-Earth asteroids that perhaps uh, pose an impact threat. In the first mission of its kind, NASA's DART spacecraft crashed into an asteroid in an attempt to change its trajectory. Scientists targeted Dimorphos, a 530-foot diameter asteroid moonlet orbiting around a larger asteroid called Didymus. Neither one is considered a danger to Earth. We are testing out a technique called a kinetic impactor. About four hours out before uh, the impact, uh, the spacecraft becomes fully autonomous, point itself towards the moon, make all the maneuvers necessary to slam itself into this really small object. Future missions like these could potentially deflect asteroids headed towards Earth. It is very impressive and hard. One of the most anticipated space events this year was finally launching Artemis 1. The first of NASA's new Artemis program, Artemis 1, tested two deep space exploration systems, including the Orion spacecraft, which splashed down in the Pacific Ocean on December 11th. This tech may be used in future missions to send humans back to the moon. Who doesn't want to go back to the moon? I mean, come on. It's a stepping stone to the rest of our future. NASA scientists hope to establish a more permanent presence on the moon and use it as a stepping stone to explore deeper into space, including Mars. We need to go there, learn how to live and work sustainably off Earth. A lot of people would like to go on to Mars, but we have a lot of experience to get under the belt before we can do that journey to Mars. In 2023, the space exploration continues. SpaceX plans to launch the Polaris Dawn mission, which will include the first commercial spacewalk and NASA plans to launch the Psyche spacecraft, an orbiter mission that will explore the asteroid Psyche. It sounds like living in a science fiction movie, but we are not living in that anymore. This is science. This is real. It's just so much fun to keep track of this, so I'm going to uh, stop and reshare my screen, and we'll get back to... The potato. So, once upon a time, there was a, a seemingly ordinary flowering dicotyledon plant with a very ordinary name, Solanum tuberosum. But her friends called her the potato. Uh, she didn't know she was destined for greatness in her humble native kingdom of the high altitude of uh, Peru and Bolivia, but it was literally in her genes to become known over the planet because she came from a long line of famous plants. And to tell this story, we need to go back many generations uh, to millions of years before a potato was born. Potato's ancestors came from a clade known as the Asterids, which is the largest group of flowering plants and a group that's uh, that gave rise to other backyard naturalist royalty like the Thanksgiving cranberry and the Christmas holly. Other members of the potato lineage gave rise to some of the most beautiful and best smelling, maybe future backyard naturalist royalty. Uh, they produce the flowers that grace our houses and our backyards, like the daisy and the forget-me-not, the majestic sunflower, morning glory, lavender that's worked its way into our laundry, sh laundry sheets, you have lilac, you have jasmine that made its way into Disney movies, you have honeysuckle and snapdragon. So a regular who's who of very popular flowers today came from the same line of plants that brought us the potato. Other members of this lineage have graced our dinner plates either as proper food or they've enhanced our dishes as a spice. So it may come, may come as no surprise that the group of plants that brought us the potato also brought us the sweet potato. Uh, that one might seem obvious, although we'll see later why it might not be. But in addition to sweet potatoes, this group brought us everyone's favorite pizza topping, uh, the olive, 
Also, everyone's favorite hamburger bun topping, the sesame plant that produced the sesame seed, and the Brazil nuts, which come from a huge tree and produce those oddly large chunks when you get the mixed nut bag. Uh, this clade has also produced the, the best, the original Spice Girls of sage and mint and basil and rosemary. Hello, rosemary. And um, this potpourri is rounded out with uh, ash trees and the baseball bats they produce or unfortunately used to produce before the emerald ash borer showed up. Um, a lot of the the major baseball bat producing companies owned and managed large forests of ash, but now uh, an increasing number of baseball bats are made from maple, but maple also tends to splinter more easily. So you have more bats that are breaking in games, which can be dangerous. Um, but back to asteroids, this line produced teak trees and, and the furniture that they produce uh, and the psyllium, which keeps us all regularly going along. Um, and do you recall the most famous asteroid of all, in my opinion, is coffee. And coffee has agreed to be one of our first guests in the year 2023. So we look forward to hearing more from coffee later. But this illustrates that this asteroid group has produced a veritable who's who of famous plants, and they're all cousins to the potato. So what about the potato itself? Um, it has, it has a, a very formidable family, but what about the actual potato line of this family? And if you look at that, it has a rather sinister beginning because its great 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 grandmother was a plant known as the nightshade. Oops, the nightshade. Uh, nightshades are in the family Solanaceae, and this lineage of plants has produced some of the most delicious plants that we know of today, and also some of the most deadly. In fact, maybe the most well-known nightshade is the deadly nightshade pictured here, which ironically has the Latin name Belladonna, which translates as beautiful lady. Um, and there's nothing inherently sinister about nightshade. It's just that this animal called Homo sapiens, in their twisted way of thinking, found out that nightshade can be used to poison, as a poison, to, to kill other members of their own species. And so our written history is full of examples of powerful people being killed through betrayal by poison via the deadly nightshade plant, which is really just trying to defend itself from insects and other animals eating it. Uh, and this entire family, this entire group is full of examples of these alkaloids, toxins, that, that can either be used as toxins or, or in, in another kind of the way that humans work uh, has been known to, to create quite a few uh, recreational or and or medicinal drugs. So it's a family with a beautiful, complicated, and somewhat sordid past. Um, but in addition to producing deadly nightshade, the nightshade family also has its share of popular and helpful plants. Uh, starting with the delicious, nightshades include the peppers, all the peppers, the bell peppers, the chili peppers, and which we all learned in, in the past Backyard nat Naturalist episode, um, as gourd as it gets from season two, these are all true berries. This family also includes some of the lesser known but equally delicious fruits like the tomatillo, the gooseberry, and the goji berry. It includes beautiful ornamental plants like the Chinese lantern and the petunia. Um, and again, because of the, the alkaloid toxins, there's just a whole host of nightshade plants that are used as recreational drugs like mandrake and a plant you may have heard of called the tobacco plant. And if we take just one step closer to the star of the show, we reach the genus the potato is in, which is Solanum. And this genus alone contains this holy trinity of popular nightshade food plants. Three closely related cousins, the tomato, the eggplant, and then finally our potato. And as we look at the whole potato plant, which unless we're growing them, we don't see very often, it's a pretty standard plant, as you'd expect, with leaves and stems and flowers and fruits. Uh, the edible part of the plant is a tuber. And so then this brings us back to the beginning, to our once upon a time, there lived a potato plant living in her native kingdom that included southern Peru and northwestern Bolivia, high in the Andes Mountains, in a very unforgiving kingdom. And our hero, the original potato, was 
A wild potato plant, given the Latin name Selenum brevicauli, which was also later called Papa de Zorro, the, the potato of Zorro. Um, this is the plant that we believe led to the modern day potato plant. Um, is part of a complex of thousands of wild potato species that ranged all the way from the Southern United States down to Southern Chile. Um, and then, so as you look at, we'll, we'll see the tubers of some of these other plants in a bit, but you can see that this particular tuber, if you look at um, on the upper right picture there, this is mostly resembles the grocery store potatoes we got today. And through other analyses, this is the plant that we believe led to our current uh, set of, of grocery store potatoes. Um, but this particular species was domesticated more than 10,000 years ago, uh, probably several thousand years, more than 13, 14,000 years ago, again, in the Andes mountain range um, by humans. And if you go there today, there are still many varieties of wild potatoes that are cultivated and thousands of years of domestication by the people that live there produced many, many varieties of potatoes. And you can see all the different little eyes of those tubers that you might recognize the eyes of a potato that kind of are all functioning here. And we'll, we'll talk about what a tuber does a little bit later. Um, but there were thousands and thousands of varieties of potatoes. And the one that started to become the most popular of these varieties among the people and the one that became the most widespread was a species by the name of Solanum tuberosum, uh, which is the one today we call the common potato, the one you're almost sure to be eating today, a variety of it. Um, all those varieties are from the same species. And um, you have actually hundreds and hundreds of varieties of this one species today, um, both through domestication in the original homeland and, um, and then uh, through efforts today of, of uh, selective breeding. At the time of the major European conquest with the Americas, um, the potato plant, for whatever reason, was still limited to that small region of the South American Andes. A lot of the other plants that Europeans, when, it, when Europeans came in contact, a lot of the other plants from South America had already made their way north through um, kind of the, the trade routes, the regular mainland trade routes or trade routes through the Caribbean. So um, things like corn and tobacco and chili peppers and peanuts, um, they had already kind of found their way throughout the continent um, through North, North and South America, uh, but potatoes hadn't. And one of the likely reasons that potatoes was still kind of in that little range is they are well adapted to the harsh conditions of the high altitudes um, in the Andes Mountains. So they are used to and adapted to growing in very cold conditions, um, which would serve them well in, in the northern parts of North America where they do grow today, um, but they'd have to get there. And because you know the main chunk of the land separating those, those areas is, is there's a lot of hot and dry. And um, so it was, it was, it kind of pr probably prevented the spreading of potatoes um, at the time. Uh, so it really took this kind of, you know, well, the, the, the brutal conquest of the Inca Empire uh, by the Spaniards to quote unquote, find the potatoes by the Western world. And the Spaniards introduced the potato to Europe as part of the, the Colombian exchange in the late 1500s. And then from there, it spread to other parts of the world particularly wherever ports were actively trading goods. Um, it was fairly easy to store and move, um, but it, it actually took quite a while for the potato to be adopted and popularized to the extent that it is today worldwide. Um, and, and especially it took a long time in Europe. It was seen as more of an oddity of a plant um, and, and people didn't have the, the, the knowledge of it um, that the people that had grown up with it do. And so, you know, for, for thousands of years. So it was kind of this new thing in Europe and and sometimes they'd mistakenly try to prepare the tomato-like fruits, which are full of toxins and made people sick. Um, so for quite a while, the potato plant was used more as a decorative plant because the flower is, is, is quite beautiful. And um, it actually took 
about 250 years for the potato to become the staple crop in Europe and, and then also spreading to other parts of the world. So slow to develop, but once it took off, it really took off. Um, and there's a lot of reasons, uh, you know, when you when you look at from a nutrition standpoint, from an ease of growing standpoint, uh, as a, as really a supplement to a good diet, um, the meat and potatoes kind of kind of thing. It it really really took off, and it it's thought to be responsible for about a quarter of the growth, uh, particularly in the northern parts of Europe and Asia, where they could grow them um, for the next 200 years. So strong impact on history and and human growth. Um, but because there were only a few varieties that were spreading, the, that lack of genetic diversity left the crop quite vulnerable to disease and, and led to a story you, you probably knew was coming this morning, the, the Great Irish Famine, which was the result of not a fungus, but a fungus-like organism that spread rapidly. And if you have a monocrop of potatoes of, of just a, a variety or two, uh, in, particularly in Ireland and parts of the Scottish Highlands and in poorer communities, uh, one of the really interesting things is that the, the potato blight, we call it the Irish, you know, famine, but it, it, it hit other parts pretty hard too. Uh, Scandinavia and Belgium, and even in the United States, it hit the United States much earlier than, than it did in, in Ireland. Um, but the reason it's really known as the Great Irish Famine is because in most of these other areas of the world outside of Ireland and Northern Scotland, people had alternatives. Um, when the potatoes went away, that was a, it had a big impact, but there were still other crops that you could turn to uh, in those really harsh environments of, of Scotland and, and Northern Ireland. This was pretty much the only crop they could reliably grow there. Uh, so, you know, in the beginning, it brought opportunity by allowing agriculture in, in areas that really couldn't sustain it at the time. It also meant that literally they were putting all those potatoes in one basket. And when the potatoes went away, people either starved or, or migrated, many to the United States. Um, and, and people weren't starving because there was no food. There was still plenty of food in Northern Ireland. This is a social class kind of thing. They starved because their way of living was taken away and they could no longer afford to buy food. Um, and, you know, again, you can't sustain yourself with other crops if there's no other crops that'll grow there. So this was an example where government assistance ended up coming along a little bit late for, for many. But but when the government assistance came along, it was fairly easy to get food back on people's plates. This is, a you know, a, a good example of a safety net that was really hindered by, again, the social and political issues. Um, so uh, you contrast this the single variety of potatoes in, in Ireland with a, a typical household in the Andes, uh, which at the same time was probably actively cultivating a hundred varieties uh, within a within a you know a, a, a social group. So much, much healthier and much less risky of a venture. Uh, the Spanish conquistadors gave our heroine the, the name we refer to her by today. They called it, they called it the Patata, which was, which is a mix of two indigenous words, the the papa, which was what the Quechua called the the popular variety of the potato, um, and then the word batata, which is what the Taino people called the sweet potato. So the Spanish combined these words and called it patata, and then the English put their own spin on the world and called it potato. Uh, and in many languages around the world today, that term for potato roughly translates as earth apple or sometimes ground apple. And we also know that potato colloquially um, as a spud. And, and that name likely comes from the act of digging the hole in the soil prior to planting the potato seed, or actually more likely the, the potato chunk with the eye in it. Um, and this term likely comes from the same root as spade, uh, the tool that often does the digging. So you dig a hole with a spud and eventually the name started to, ref to refer to the potato itself. And as a, with a little bit of a kind of fascinating side note, um, and I think many others probably associate potatoes with sweet potatoes. It makes sense. They both have potatoes in the name. Um, but actually these two plants are not closely related. They're, they're both in that big asteroid clade I mentioned, but they're like seventh cousins. The botanically, they are not closely related at all. 
And I think the reason that we tend to lump these plants together is because it's one of the few plants where we eat the tuber and the tuber in these cases are structurally very similar. Um, so most people in the Western world, again, probably only regularly come across potatoes and sweet potatoes as, as the edible tubers. There are things like cassava and, uh, and other things, particularly in South America. The, the purpose of the tuber for the plant is twofold. First, it allows this perennial plant to store energy to grow the following year. So remember, these the potatoes in particular are adapted to very harsh environments, harsh mountain environments. And so as the days kind of get shorter in the fall, the plant starts to invest a lot of its energy in these tubers, which it's like storing things in your cellar that'll get us get it through that, that harsh winter, storing the energy underground. And then the other point of tubers is to allow the plant to reproduce. Um, so we'll, we'll know, we'll see that there's, there's several ways that the plant can reproduce. Um, this allows the plant to reproduce asexually through cloning. Um, so in a harsh environment, if you have more ways to make more copies of yourself, that's a good thing. Um, so even though they're not closely related, uh, the fact that tubers, and even, even within the two, the tubers from potatoes are actually stem tubers. They're part of the stem. And the tubers of sweet potatoes are actually part of the root. So they're root tubers. So not related plants, not even related anatomically. Um, but again, because they kind of look the same, you treat them the same. Um, a lot of cultures didn't even distinguish between the two. They were, they were, you know, we'll, we'll, we see them as potato and sweet potato. Um, but for many, the word potato actually more commonly referred to what we call the sweet potato. And if there were distinctions, they were made with what we call a potato. So the potato was either the white potato, the Virginia potato, the Irish potato, or the bastard potato, which distinguished it from the common potato, which we call the sweet potato. So um, this is a good time to take a first of two short video breaks. Um, this is a nice TED talk that kind of sums up the history through the eyes of the potato. Baked or fried, boiled or roasted, as chips or fries. At some point in your life, you've probably eaten a potato. Delicious, for sure. But the fact is, potatoes have played a much more significant role in our history than just that of the dietary staple we have come to know and love today. Without the potato, our modern civilization might not exist at all. 8,000 years ago in South America, high atop the Andes, ancient Peruvians were the first to cultivate the potato, containing high levels of proteins and carbohydrates, as well as essential fats, vitamins, and minerals, potatoes were the perfect food source to fuel a large Incan working class as they built and farmed their terraced fields, mined the Rocky Mountains, and created the sophisticated civilization of the great Incan Empire. But considering how vital they were to the Incan people, when Spanish sailors returning from the Andes first brought potatoes to Europe, the spuds were duds. Europeans simply didn't want to eat what they considered dull and tasteless oddities from a strange new land, too closely related to the deadly nightshade plant, belladonna, for comfort. So instead of consuming them, they used potatoes as decorative garden plants. More than 200 years would pass before the potato caught on as a major food source throughout Europe, though even then it was predominantly eaten by the lower classes. However, beginning around 1750, and thanks at least in part to the wide availability of inexpensive and nutritious potatoes, European peasants with greater food security no longer found themselves at the mercy of the regularly occurring grain famines of the time, and so their population steadily grew. As a result, the British, Dutch, and German empires rose on the backs of the growing groups of farmers, laborers, and soldiers, thus lifting the West to its place of world dominion. However, not all European countries sprouted empires. After the Irish adopted the potato, their population dramatically increased, as did their dependence on the tuber as a major food staple. But then disaster struck. From 1845 to 1852, potato blight disease ravaged the majority of Ireland's potato crop, leading to the Irish potato famine. 
one of the deadliest famines in world history. Over a million Irish citizens starved to death, and two million more left their homes behind. But of course, this wasn't the end for the potato. The crop eventually recovered, and Europe's population, especially the working classes, continued to increase. Aided by the influx of Irish migrants, Europe now had a large, sustainable, and well-fed population who were capable of manning the emerging factories that would bring about our modern world via the Industrial Revolution. So it's almost impossible to imagine a world without the potato. Would the Industrial Revolution ever have happened? Would World War II have been lost by the Allies without this easy-to-grow crop that fed the Allied troops? Would it even have started? When you think about it like this, many major milestones in world history can all be at least partially attributed to the simple spud from the Peruvian hilltops. All right. Let's see if I can move this. There we go. All right, so let's look at the plant itself now. Um, it's a perennial, uh, it, meaning, you know, self-sustaining. It's a herbaceous plant, grows about two feet high. Um, it produces beautiful flowers of many different colors, depending on the variety. And, and these flowers can either self-pollinate or they can cross-pollinate through the help of insects like bumblebees. And again, if you're growing in a harsh environment, if you can have more than one way of reproducing, that's a, that's a plus. After pollination, the flowers turn into a kind of green cherry tomato-like fruit with about 300 seeds. Um, and this is where you can see that the plant is closely related to the tomato um, and why you know a lot of the Europeans thought they could prepare it like a tomato. Um, but the main difference is that the potato fruit is, is mostly toxic. Uh, it's a very important distinction. And um, so again, as the day length began to decrease, the plant uh, begins to store energy in the tubers that we are familiar with um, to store energy so that starting you know, next spring when the, the short growing season, they can get a, a head start. Um, and the tubers really are the only parts of the plant that aren't toxic. They're not completely toxin free, um, but when you look at the, the glycosides that are in the plant, there's, there's mostly concentrated in the stems and the leaves and the fruits. And, you know, that makes sense because from the plant's perspective, uh, other that you want to attract some insects for pollination, but you can't afford to have a lot of other things munching on you when your your very survival depends on saving this energy. So the potato potato doesn't want things to eat it, so that's where the toxin comes in, and and it's it's found in most of the plant. But most of the things that would want to eat it naturally are above ground, and it's not as worried about the things eating the the below ground parts. So to save energy, it doesn't produce the toxin, which is costly, um, or, or nearly as much of the toxin below ground, which is why that's the part that we can eat. Um, so, you know, we can see that as like a normal plant, this, this plant can produce sexually. Um, but another way to propagate potatoes is, is vegetatively. So you can take a piece of the potato tuber, making sure you have at least one or two eyes, um, and as, as you know, if you've left a potato in the fridge or the counter, that, that eye will grow into a new plant. And that, that time, if, if through that mode of reproduction, that's a genetic clone of the parent plant. So this gives the potato really three ways to reproduce, uh, which again is handy in a harsh environment. Um, they can self-pollinate, they can cross-pollinate, and they can clone themselves. And for humans, it's this cloning part that made potatoes so ready and easy to, you know, so easy to propagate. So almost all potatoes today are grown through cloning, through this, um, you know, just uh, cutting up a piece of the potato. Um, one potato plant can produce a lot of potatoes. Each of those potatoes has a lot of eyes. So one potato plant can lead to hundreds of offspring very quickly. So it can spread very, very quickly. Um, and then the other reason that most potatoes are propagated this method is that uh, if you if you do if you produce if you do the pollination method, you get a lot more variation. You get variation in color. You get variation in size. Um, and for a lot of people that are producing this, they kind of want their characteristics, whatever whatever variation they have, um, 
they, that's what they want um, the offspring to be. So this is the way most uh, potatoes, uh, at least the cultivated potatoes are grown. And today there are about 5,000 known cultivated varieties of potatoes that only belong to about nine species. Most of them, again, are in the South American Andes. Um, and in addition to the cultivated varieties there, there, there are probably more than 200 wild species of potatoes uh, that are still around, um, species, subspecies, which are, are, are still sometimes um, harvested. And they can all be crossbred with cultivated varieties and that can help um, you know, in, in transferring resistance uh, to certain pests or certain diseases or certain qualities that you that you want to keep. In the modern culinary world, potato varieties fall into a few groups, the grocery store potatoes based on, on some shared characteristics. So you have the russet potato, which is probably the most popular potato uh, in the US, maybe the most familiar. And then you also have red potatoes, you have white potatoes, uh, some of these other varieties are becoming a little more popular. You have purple potatoes, uh, and then you have the prized yellow potatoes, particularly the ones, uh, the, the variety called Yukon Gold. And of course, um, in addition to this, some potatoes just have good characteristics that are, are, are characteristics that are good for chipping, uh, turning potatoes into chips. And incidentally, when you do that, and, and if you don't want to hear me just close your eyes but there's actually it kind of strips every single possible nutritional value of the potato away when you slice them that thin and you fry them um, but boy are they delicious uh, so some some potatoes are good for salads uh, others are good for baking and you know the, the characteristics that make certain potatoes good for certain uses has to do with the chemistry, the starch content, the characteristics of the skin, how loosely fit is that skin, how waxy, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can divide up um, the potato varieties. In 2020, worldwide production of potatoes was about 400 million tons. Per capita production is still highest in Northern and Eastern Europe, but um, areas of Southern and Eastern Asia are expanding um, quite rapidly in their potato consumption to the point now where China leads the world in potato production, production producing about 22% of the world's potatoes, followed by India, and then Russia, Ukraine, and the United States. That rounds up the, the top five. They're a rich source of vitamins B6 and vitamin C. They also have tons of other minerals. Um, interestingly, when you cook a potato, though, it, which makes it much easier for us to digest them, you can eat them raw. Um, but when you cook them, the amounts of these, of the, the really, the, the kickers, the C and the, and the B, they start to decline notably. Um, they have a high glycemic index, um, but when you reheat potatoes, the glycemic index declines. Um, and, you know, there's no fat in potatoes, but we tend to serve them with a lot of things that have fat. Um, so... There's there's always this debate, just kind of like with a lot of other things, is you know what's is it good for you? Is it not good for you? What parts of it, the fat, the protein, that kind of thing? I mean, there's no protein either. Um, but I I probably don't need to tell anyone here the multitude of ways that potatoes are prepared and eaten here in the U.S. Um, we all know that there are many, and we also know that objectively, the best way to eat potatoes is in tater tot form, preferably from a school hot lunch. Um, maybe second only to the mock chicken legs. And I probably don't need to mention that potatoes are enjoyed particularly during the holidays here and around the world. And if you if you really want to embrace the potato, you know, head down to Peru, head down to the to the the homeland, the the natural homeland of the potatoes, again, where there's thousands of varieties grown. Um, it's no surprise to learn that that many dishes have potatoes as their primary ingredient in those areas of South America and are still baked with traditional methods, uh, off, sometimes buried along with hot rocks. So if you really want to explore your inner potato and get outside of your, your current potato box, um, that would be the place to go. Uh, of course, the, the next big hot place for potatoes was Europe, and they, they put their own many and varied spins on cooking potatoes from, you know, your classic fish and chips to to uh, potato pancakes, to Italian nachi, 
Um, I, I love that there are powdered potatoes. You can get instant potatoes, which first just seemed ridiculous to me. Um, but then if you if you take a closer look, um, one of the problems with potatoes is that they don't actually store well. Um, you know, if you, they only store as an, an edible food source um, for a couple of months, but uh, in, in the traditional uh, lands where this grew up, one of the ways to prepare potatoes was in the Andes was to, to spread, spread potatoes out and just smash them with your feet, like mashing, mashing the potatoes with your feet. Um, and uh, and then leaving him out, so it gets kind of the juices out, the water out, leaving it out for freeze thaw cycle. And then the next day when the sun is back up, smash him some more. And then eventually you get what's really like a flat freeze dried potato. Um, so, so the fact that there's these freeze dries or instant tomatoes or instant potatoes, excuse me, um, really does have its root in, in the homeland. And then you can store that flattened version of the potatoes, the freeze dried potatoes um, for a long, long, long time. And then of course, you know, we, we freeze potatoes, there's frozen potatoes you can get at the, um, the supermarket. Um, but again, what seemed a little ridiculous to me actually has its roots in, uh, in, in potato culture for, for thousands of years. Um, you, then, you know, heading over to the the Asian continent where it's it's maybe the, the next stage where potatoes took off, you have things like samosas and masala dosa and um, uh, some other dishes. And this doesn't even scratch the surface of the non-food ways that uh, potatoes have influenced us from vodka. There's not a lot of vodka are made from potatoes, even in places like Russian and Poland, where we think where I think there's this uh, this impression that most of the vodka comes from potatoes it actually doesn't. Most vodka still comes from wheat and rye, but there are still still places that make uh, potato vodka. It's used as fodder for livestock. Um, potato starch is used as a thickener. Um, it also can be used as an adhesive. Uh, and then of course you have the original potato head, which um, didn't come with a potato. You 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 supplied your own potato and it had the body parts. So. As we bring this uh, potato hour to a close, I do want to say that I'm telling the story from my lens of of the Western world. Uh, you know, the, the the true potato experts are the people that have lived with potatoes for thousands of years and can tell a much richer story. I also grew up in a in a Christian influenced household, um, but I was really drawn to for this episode in particular was the story of of how potato latkes became tied to Hanukkah, and so we'll wrap this episode up with this story. Um, told by someone that is steeped in the tradition. Tis the season for these delicious treats, latkes hot off the griddle, as much a part of Hanukkah as tonight's initial lighting of the menorah. Martha Teichner invites us to a tasting. After the second or two it takes to light that candle, what is the logical thing to do next? Eat. Latkes, of course. Crispy, fried, slightly oniony potato pancakes with decadent, that's a euphemism for fattening, toppings. Why latkes? The simple answer is that they're meant to remind Jews of the miracle of the oil associated with Hanukkah. But this story is anything but simple. In 164 BCE, a devout Jew who called himself Judah Maccabee and his followers overthrew the Syrian Greek king who was trying to impose Greek customs and religion on the people of Israel. Hanukkah means dedication. It commemorates the victory of the Maccabees who retook the temple. Jane Cohen is a Jewish food historian and cookbook writer. And when they re-sanctified the temple and cleaned everything, they needed ritual oil for the candelabra. And the only ritual oil that was pure enough was only enough to last for one day, according to the story. But miraculously, it lasted eight days. 
Centuries after the fact, Jews were told to celebrate by eating foods cooked in oil. But again, why latkes? Enter Judith, darling of the art world. Judith was, according to all accounts, this beautiful widow. And she set out to seduce Holofernes, who was holding the town of Bethulia under siege. And she had these very salty pancakes, levy vote, and filled them with a salty cheese. And Holofernes, who intended to seduce or rape her, kept eating these. And he became so thirsty that he just drank incredible quantities of wine until he passed out. At which point, this beautiful widow chopped off his head. How does Judith get connected with Hanukkah? That's where the bizarre part comes in. Nobody is actually sure how the two became conflated. But they did. And by the Middle Ages, Jews in Italy were eating cheese pancakes during Hanukkah. Now we come to the potato. Potatoes were cheap. And thanks to poverty among Eastern European Jews, potatoes became the key ingredient in latkes, Yiddish for pancakes. Like at just a normal day, when there's no holiday, we make a thousand a day. And then during Hanukkah, we'll make 5,000 a day. Wow. Nikki Russ Fetterman is a fourth generation owner of Russ and Daughters in New York City. For 105 years, her family's business has been Jewish food. The latkes are made in small batches, by hand. You commune with the ancestors when you do this. Well, I suppose you do. Is there a technique to squishing? No, just squish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's a secret to getting latkes right, it's this. This is fun. I like this. Straining out extra liquid. Press it down. The mixture is formed into patties, which are first fried on the griddle, then deep fried in oil, canola oil here. They're meant to be eaten crispy and warm. The story of Hanukkah and the latka is, is one of perseverance and a little bit of magic, and that's a universal story. Which is how the Brooklyn Museum justifies certain liberties taken by chefs participating in its annual latke festival. Have you ever heard of Vietnamese latkes? Or how about Korean sweet potato latkes? Hanukkah is considered a minor holiday for Jews, but it's got this going for it. We made them, we might as well, okay. you know, eat them. The Talmud, Judaism's Book of Laws, decrees that during Hanukkah, there is to be no grieving and no fasting. These are really good. No problem. Mm, that's really good too. If the latkes are good and plentiful. Yum. Yeah. All right. Tis the so that's uh, the potato episode. Thank you for joining me. I know as I, uh, I do so often, no, no matter who's giving the talks these uh, every Friday morning, I, I just try to take a little bit away from this and, I, and, and strengthen my relationship with, uh, with nature and, and in this case, food. And so, you know, to me, it's pretty cool to think that what you're eating when you're eating a potato is you're eating an adaptation to a really harsh environment in, in the Andes and you're tapping into uh, a really remarkable adaptation um, to, to store food uh, until the times become good again. So thank you so much for joining me. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm going to stop recording.